and can be analysed by itself in its own isolation. So the opposite of reductionism for mine is, is holism, and holistic thinking where you say, no matter how isolated we want to think some things are, they all have interplay. There's connection between all of them. And so, for example, uh, at schools, you have subjects which are segregated, right? So mathematics is separate from English, is separate from uh, history, etc. When, in fact, we know that there's an interplay between all of those, and the best teachers that I've seen, that I remember, were the ones who were actually talking about English within the maths class, and were talking about history within the English class, and were showing, demonstrating by example, the interplay between all of those things simultaneously. This is exactly uh, a good point to talk about then what they're calling the true convergence technology called nanotechnology, where these are converging together and not so reductionistic as they used to be. Uh, you've written two uh, meta-analyses on nanotechnology in society. Uh, one of them is on equality and then the other one's on sustainability. Can you talk about uh, the social implications of uh, nanotechnology? Well, it's probably worth starting just by explaining nanotechnology a little bit. Uh, it's been a while since I've actually looked into it, so uh, this definition might be a little rusty, but most people are familiar with biotechnology and, and that, that works on the level of cells in terms of engaging um, technologically with cells. When you deal with nanotechnology, you go down a level to the level of atoms and small molecules. And interesting things happen at that level because you move into the realm of quantum physics. And so nanotechnology is the exploitation of the unique properties that happen when you move into the realm of atoms and molecules and are able to actually work on that level. As you mentioned, technologies are converging around the nanoscale, whether it's physics, chemistry, biology, chemistry is coming down to that scale, physics moving up to that scale, biology uh, is surrounding that space, and IT and mathematics play into it as well. And so one of the interesting implications, as you alluded to, is the fact that for the first time, for some people who perhaps didn't engage in biotechnology, for the first time, there are, the, a physicist is actually having to talk to the biologists because they don't understand, given that reductionist framework that they're operating in, the differences, the nuances that are required to understand how the systems work as a whole on that level. And that's interesting for me because when I was at university, I never studied, I studied sports science, uh, and so I had this idea of scientists knowing all aspects of science. I didn't understand that science was actually divided into various uh, categories and that a physicist really doesn't know that much about chemistry or an electrical engineer maybe doesn't know much about mechatronic engineering. I always thought that there was just that uh, interplay across, across the, the whole realm. So that's an interesting thing that's happening as an implication of nanotechnology. Another one is that when you get down to the level of atoms and molecules, as people can understand perhaps, when you, just from a layman's perspective, when you start going down to a smaller level, you're actually then designing things that can be more multifunctional. So something which uh, might be a sensor, for example, a, a medical sensor, could also be uh, simultaneously a delivery mechanism um, in terms of uh, a pharmaceutical administration. Those two things can happen simultaneously because you're dealing with things that have greater surface area, that have different properties, that actually operate in much more reactive sensors. And when we can manipulate them, we can manipulate them with more precision as well. Now, the interesting thing there is, historically, we've been moving smaller and smaller with the things that we can patent the things that we say we have intellectual property over. So nanotechnology is interesting and, and quite frightening in a sense because it allows companies to move the patenting game to an ever smaller level, which is greater in its platform nature. So companies, we saw this very early on in, in the last 10 years, uh, really the, the nascent phase of nanotechnology, where companies were patenting things that were blocking out whole areas of research, particularly in areas around water, quantum dots, etc. And so that's an interesting thing that happens when you chat, when you move into this space uh, of smallness, 
beyond the biotechnology sphere that you can actually wrap up control with big corporations, with, with government departments, with defence, etc., much faster than you could on the biotechnology uh, level. And biotechnology, as we know, was already patented fast. So that's an interesting implication. And of course, you've got some of the, the wonderfully exciting implications as well, too. The fact that nature, um, as replicated by many people working in nanotechnology, has this wonderful um, thing of self-assembly, where molecules and, and chemicals will actually self-assemble into lattices, into structures, uh, as they do in nature, uh, all throughout nature. And we're beginning to understand that, a little bit like with biomimicry, um, we're beginning to understand how we can replicate those processes and actually take the human need or the human touch out of it uh, in terms of the, the engineering process and use uh, self-assembly and chemistry to actually create interesting new structures um, and to actually create things that replicate nature as such. Oh, this is quite fascinating, um, of course. And uh, one thing I wanted to make a comment and then I'll come up with another question is uh, this issue of science literacy, something that you've worked on, uh, in both science literacy and economics literacy. Uh, mm -hmm. People like uh, Linus Pauling, for example, he won two Nobel Prizes alone, one for peace and one for chemistry. Uh, he brought, his work brought together physics and chemistry uh, 60, 70 years ago, yet we're only just talking about this now at, in society. I mean, scientists have known it before and philosophers and thinkers. Um, so there's a real lag in science literacy out there, and as you described, nanotechnology uh, going down to the very, very small levels of 10 to the negative 9. And then uh, one aspect that you talk about here is the economics of it, the um, patenting and all of that. So since most of your work right now is in economics, why don't we move over to economics both in the science and into the, the community development stuff. Uh, I think maybe the question I want to ask is, uh, who, who owns all of this that we're talking about? Well, and increasing, uh, increasingly it's less and less people. Um, the knowledge is being tied up uh, in cutting edge science often um, by a number of key players in, in the US, in Europe, and in East Asia. And as you know, this is a, a challenge in terms of access to innovation, both in terms of access to products that come from innovation, and also in terms of basic research and the ability to do basic research. See, lots of people forget that DNA, for example, was the double helix structure, was actually developed without the profit motive was developed in a public institution, uh, as has happened throughout history with lots of the big discoveries. And it was only until recently that these things were happening in the public sphere and it was public knowledge. It wasn't owned by anyone as such. The last 30, 40 years has seen a rapid shift in that towards the proprietization of knowledge. And it's an interesting thing because I think with, with all of these sorts of shifts, we, we are starting to see now the pendulum return back to the other direction, to, common, to the commons, to peer production, peer-to-peer uh, -peer production, and to the openness um, associated with innovation that we know once you can actually deal with, or once the behemoths of the multinational corporations hit limits or, uh, or start to get severely diminishing rates of return on their profit, then what happens, interestingly, in, in my understanding, is that open business models actually start to become more competitive again. And I think that's where we're starting to move now, is to a shift back. Even though increasingly there's, there's few, fewer and fewer people who are tying up the knowledge, what's happening simultaneously is we're seeing something coming through that is going to subvert the whole system in the next 30 or 40 years. I mean, take, for example, the illiteracy that is associated with coding around the world now, particularly in countries like India, where people of age... 10 and 11 and 12 are at a standard of literacy in terms of coding that would be the equivalent standard in science of maybe a, a, an assistant professor. And that's a phenomenon 
that can't help but change the game in the next little while. And we've seen that with the emergence of things like Code Academy that's got 200,000 people from memory every week learning to code. Now, coding is interesting because that ties in with the open software movement in the, in the 70s through Linux and other things that have emerged since then. When, where people said, hey, we can actually innovate better by opening up the source code. And we're now starting to see this with science as well, where companies themselves are saying, hey, maybe there's actually more innovation to be had outside of the proprietary knowledge system. And this is something that I think the big, the big players aren't going to go down uh, without fighting. But I think what they're going to do is they're going to have the fight with people like they did with uh, Cipla and the drugs in India in terms of parallel production, you know, over who has the patent rights and whether or not you can uh, produce alternatives whilst, whilst they're under patent. I think people are going to get caught up in that fight, in the big players. And meanwhile, all around the world, we're going to see people, hackers, uh, people part of the maker movement, continue to work on opening up science and returning science to the public domain. And what you're describing here, I want to make just a distinction for, for readers, because, I, of course, I've read your books. Um, what you're talking about in the case of, say, Cipro or HIV drugs, you're talking about life-sustaining drugs. You're, you're not talking about, for example, tennis rackets or a, a new computer, yeah. right? So, fine, have the free market for the tennis rackets, but for the life-saving drugs, uh, we need some other model. Hmm. Okay, moving, move on. Go, go, uh, keep going with this community development thing. So, post growth institute. Uh, how do we have post growth? And I know that you talk about no growth, but prosperity with no growth. I want to hear your argument. Well, I was born in 1982, and well, no. Let me start. In fact, uh, in the way that that I think is very important for any engagement in these issues. It's called an asset based approach. So. I try uh, with my own work and in my own speaking and with Post Growth Institute to look at what's working first. And in this sense, there are wonderful things happening all around the world, as have happened throughout history. I'm, I mean, I live in Australia, a country where for 60,000 years, people lived without growth and were very innovative, very resilient, had uh, interesting, deep dynamics uh, in terms of kinship relationships with land, with each other, etc., for 60,000 years without economic growth. This is not to say, you know, as many people say, that, that post-growth economics is about returning back to certain pasts. It's about transcending what happens now, taking the good bits out of capitalism, but saying essentially that it's a model that hasn't worked for everyone, and that if we want an economics for all, we need to transition to new, a new model, a new system that is already there, already emerged, but hasn't become the dominant model yet. I mean, taking up that line, uh, post-growth futures are here, they're just not evenly distributed. So different things that are happening around the world, whether it's the transition town movement, whether it's drawing on aspects of uh, Islamic banking and the principle of Qad al-Hassan, of non-interest bearing loans, um, various things are happening that actually give little bits of wisdom for how post growth futures in a macroeconomic sense could actually occur. We see that coming back as well in the open source movement, looking at open source ecology and Marcin Jakubowski's work uh, in, in the Factor Eat farm in Missouri, where they're actually relocalizing industrialization by taking scrap metals and open source design, fusing those two things together and saying, we can produce locally the 50 basic machines of industrial production. So what we're seeing is almost a perfect storm emerging of wonderful initiatives that are just waiting for someone or groups of people or people more broadly to put the dots together and say, what's the economic framework, the underpinning that is incentivized for innovation that actually can hold this together in a system that doesn't extract from nature at a speed that is incompatible with sustainability? 